Well, I've reached another milestone on Patreon, which means it's time for me to review another Godzilla movie. Maybe this means I won't get comments on this video asking when the next Godzilla review is. <laughs> yeah, right. So when we last left Godzilla, the final film in the original series, Terror of Mechagodzilla, went on to become the lowest grossing Godzilla film of all time at the box office, and as a result, the series ended up going on hiatus for almost a decade. But then in 1984, Toho decided to bring Godzilla back to the big screen. After years of pandering to little kids, Toho decided to return to the series' roots, depicting Godzilla as a destructive, fearsome monster, while also updating him for modern audiences. The movie was released in Japan as just Godzilla, but to avoid confusion with the original film, it's usually referred to as The Return of Godzilla. Toho was reportedly so confident in their new Godzilla movie that they shopped the North American distribution rights around to several major Hollywood movie studios. But when none of them showed any interest, the movie was picked up by Roger Corman's New World Pictures instead. And rather than simply doing a straight English dub of the movie, New World filmed additional scenes and re-edited the movie, releasing it as Godzilla 1985. And this one holds some sentimental value to me, because this was the first Godzilla movie I ever saw. Yep, I have this movie to thank for making me a Godzilla fan. It's also still one of my favorites, coming in at number 5 on my top 10 best Godzilla movies list. So it's weird that for a long time, this was the only Godzilla movie that wasn't available on DVD or Blu-ray. And when it finally did get released in 2016, it only included a straight English dub of the original Japanese version and not the re-edited American version. Well, I'm guessing the Godzilla 1985 version is probably how most of you first saw this movie, so that's what I'm going to review. And also because this movie doesn't really have the greatest reputation in the world. Godzilla 1985 wasn't exactly well received by critics. Leonard Maltin gave the movie his lowest rating, saying that it was too straight to be funny. Boy, you said it, Leonard. I wish more people would have said that about the first Godzilla movie. <laughs> BE MORE FUNNY! Okay, so mainstream critics didn't like it. No surprise there. That's pretty much par for the course for Godzilla movies. But even G-fans don't really seem to care for this one. So is Godzilla 1985 the stinker some people say it is? Let's find out. Oh, uh, I have nothing to add here. It's just this worked really well the last few Godzilla videos I did it in, so, you know, figured I'd do it again. Right away you know the movie means business just from the opening theme. Okay, so it's not as memorable as the classic Godzilla theme, but considering most of the Godzilla movies I've reviewed so far open like this... This is a big improvement. So the movie opens on a Japanese fishing boat in the middle of a storm, which doesn't do much to reassure people who've seen the 1998 Godzilla movie. The helm isn't responding at all! She's gonna run aground! Yeah, you wish that's all that's gonna happen to you. The Japanese version of Deadliest Catch lives up to its name, motherfucker. <laughs> Phew, looks like the whole thing was just a nightmare of Raymond Burr's. Now he can get back to making Perry Mason TV movies. Eventually the fishing boat is found by a guy out sailing. Hopefully he can figure out what happened. Hello? Anybody there? Hmm, if this were a slasher movie, I'd expect this guy to end up with a knife in his face. Actually, considering what he does end up finding on the ship, maybe this is a slasher movie. He also shows why you should never snoop around in people's bedrooms when they're not expecting you. Ugh. Seriously though, did this guy just wander into a zombie movie? <laughs> oh, never mind, he's in an alien movie. You do not want to know what face huggers do to people in Japan. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, movie! I was just kidding! Thankfully, he's saved by the only surviving crew member, who again looks like he just stepped out of a Friday the 13th movie. In fact, even the daytime scenes in this movie have a gray, ominous look to them. You know, Leonard Maltin was right. So far, this comedy isn't very funny at all. Oh, and if you're wondering how this guy managed to survive while everyone else got turned into radioactive mummies, it's because he was wearing a life jacket. They protect against more than just drowning, you know. 
Anyway, tell us about what you saw. It was huge. It was like a monster. Yeah, we're in Japan. You're gonna need to be a lot more specific. Godzilla. There you go. I was hoping I'd never hear that name again. Why not? He's a cash cow for Japan. This movie is both a sequel and reboot of the series, ignoring all the previous films except for the first one. Fine by me, the original Godzilla series had a pretty loose continuity anyway. Plus, this means Minion never existed. The guy from the sailboat earlier is actually a reporter named Maki, but his boss doesn't seem too keen on publishing his story. What's the big secret? The big secret is... Godzilla. Godzilla? If we print your article, we'll plunge the whole country into panic. Yes, much better to wait until he attacks Tokyo and have people panic then. That'll look a lot better on film. Maki is told to go see a scientist called Professor Hayashida who's researching Godzilla, and I can see why he's the only one who might be able to stop him since he looks like Japanese Charles Bronson. He's about to go straight up Death Wish on Godzilla's ass. What's that you're working on? Genetic mutation designs. Does it have something to do with Godzilla? Well, hey, Godzilla's opponents in future movies gotta come from somewhere, don't they? Hopefully Professor Hayashida can give us some insight into Godzilla. They say Godzilla's a mutation. A monster made by intense radioactivity. He's a product of civilization. Men are the only real monsters. <laughs> okay, Bukowski. We also learned that the professor's assistant is also the sister of the guy from the fishing boat. Uh, what is this guy's name? Kenny! <laughs> uh, did she just say Kenny? If people were kind to Gamera, I bet he could be trained to be nice and quiet. No, no, this isn't a Gamera movie, this is a Godzilla movie. Godzilla is way too good to ever have a Kenny in one of his movies. I won't do you guys. He's mostly too good to have a Kenny in one of his movies. Meanwhile, in the hunt for Red October, a Soviet submarine sees something weird on their sonar, so best fire some torpedoes at it. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> You know, this is actually a pretty tense scene, and it shows Godzilla can still be threatening even when he's not actually on screen. But oh wait, I forgot that's not funny. Bomb! And who could have possibly guessed something bad would happen to a submarine in a Godzilla movie? <laughs> We're now off to the Pentagon for some of the American scenes, and I'm not sure what it is, but I suddenly have a hankering for a Dr. Pepper. Yeah, part of this movie's release in North America included a partnership with Dr. Pepper, which not only included product placement in the actual movie, but also commercials featuring Godzilla. Hold out, hold out the ordinary, hold out for Dr. Sadly, the campaign was considered something of a failure since it didn't produce any Godzilla approves memes. And besides, we all know what soft drink real men prefer. Driving through the woods in the middle of nowhere with your bandmates and assorted groupies to fight the forces of evil as betrayed by a poorly done satanic puppet and some weird looking penis gremlins? Try Coca-Cola. It's what rocker John Michael Thor recommends. Will that and spike metal under roofs? Just look at that crotch area. Coca-Cola, fight against the forces of evil. Okay, I would make fun of that more, but compared to a lot of modern day movies, the product placement here is downright subtle. We've got some more news. The submarine situation is escalating rapidly into a major international incident. Oh, right. A major theme throughout the movie involves escalating tension between the U.S. and Soviet Union, and considering Godzilla was meant to be a metaphor for the destructive power of nuclear weapons, it makes sense for this movie to reflect the real possibility of nuclear war that existed at the time. Oh, but come on, don't they know stuff like this just ruins the fun? This needed to be a simple, goofy monster movie. That way, critics could have ripped on it for not having any substance. Anyway, better tell people about Godzilla. He was huge. <laughs> yeah, we know Godzilla's big, Kenny. You're gonna have to give us a little more than that. So while the newspapers show some of the movie's alternate titles, both the US and Soviet Union want to use nuclear weapons on Godzilla, but the Prime Minister doesn't want any nukes used on Japanese soil. I can't imagine why. Oh, and there's a Soviet ship with nuclear missile codes sitting in Tokyo Bay. 
Funny, I had no idea sleeveless Pugsley Adams shirts were standard issue for the Soviet military. And are you sure that's a picture of Godzilla and not the Grimace? Godzilla must be 80 meters tall. Oh, really? I thought he was just huge. And I suppose it's about time Godzilla made his first proper appearance in the movie. <laughs> really? You didn't see him standing there? There's only one thing worse than being killed by Godzilla, and that's having the last thing you see be a close-up of his taint. One thing you may notice is Godzilla's been given a bit of a facelift here. Sure, the movie still uses the tried-and-true techniques of a man in a suit stomping on models, but considering the previous Godzilla movies I've done mostly had him fighting in open fields with suits that look two sizes too big for the actor, this is a lot better. I will admit, though, in some shots, he still looks a little cookie monster-ish. But instead of being hungry for cookies, Godzilla's hungry for some radiation. Godzilla's consuming. Sure he wouldn't find a Dr. Pepper more satisfying? Eventually, though, Godzilla leaves after being distracted by a flock of seagulls. It was the 80s, after all. Hey, easy, kid. This is Godzilla, not Transformers. I'll get to that later. Also, watch the Dr. Pepper can. Raymond Burr reprises his role from the American version of the first Godzilla movie as reporter Steve Martin, and appropriately, not only is Godzilla bigger than he was in the first movie, but so is he. Anyway, hopefully Professor Hayashida can learn more about Godzilla using these pictures the Predator gave him. The birds flew to the ocean, chirping. Then Godzilla seemed to follow them. Do you think there's a connection? Absolutely. Of course, he heard the flock of seagulls, and then he ran. He ran so far away. Professor Hayashida plans to use a bird signal to lure Godzilla into a volcano and then trap him with a controlled eruption, while the army wants to use a new weapon called the Super X against Godzilla. Both ideas make more sense than what the Americans are doing, which is just watching the first movie. You may have to rethink your strategies, gentlemen. Who are you? Name is Martin. But ever since the jerk came out, I can't tell you my full name. The army's called on Martin to see if he can figure out a way to stop Godzilla, but I get the feeling he's not gonna be much help. We must understand him, deal with him, perhaps even try to communicate with him. And just for the record, 30 years ago they never found any corpse. Uh, yeah, that's because he disintegrated at the end of the first movie. Don't you remember? You know, maybe it's a good thing they're watching the first movie. It sounds like he needs a refresher on what happened in it. And they better figure out a plan quick. Godzilla's on his way to Tokyo. Godzilla has just been sighted approaching the heart of Tokyo Bay. Yeah, fuck this shit, I'm out of here. And listen, fellas, those weapons aren't gonna do much against Godzilla. You'd be better off just running away too. Oh, too late. Now well, it looks like the Japanese army's been practicing since Godzilla last appeared. They actually managed to hit him this time. Not that it does any good, of course. And once again, I gotta give props to the actors inside the Godzilla suit. Most actors wouldn't be willing to have explosives strapped to them. Well, the jets didn't work. Let's see if the guys on shore do any better. <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Godzilla is king. In response to Godzilla's attack, the Soviet freighter launches a nuclear missile from a satellite. Actually, in the original Japanese version, the Soviet officer tries to stop the missile from launching, but in the American version, they changed it to make it look like he launched it on purpose because, you know, Cold War and everything. Well, I for one am glad times have changed and now the US and Russia no longer have any problems with each other. Meanwhile, I bet these civilians are really wishing they evacuated back when they first heard Godzilla was coming. There's only one thing Godzilla hates more than Tokyo, and that's... um... Ghostbusters? I have no idea how many people are being killed right now, but I do know the new Godzilla ride at Universal Studios looks amazing. But there's still a few bugs they need to work out. And here's the series returning to its roots, with Godzilla back to being a ruthless, unstoppable engine of destruction. But something tells me the American scenes aren't taking this seriously. That's, uh, quite an urban renewal program they got going over there. <laughs> it's funny because there's so many people getting killed right now! 
<laughs> hey, hey, I think if you listen close enough, you can actually hear the screams of all the orphan children crying out for their dead parents. <laughs> oh, those fucking assholes. Actually, supposedly the American distributors originally wanted to completely redo the dialogue and turn the movie into a straight-up comedy, but Raymond Burr refused to participate unless they took the movie seriously. Alright, I know I've made some jokes at Raymond Burr's expense in this video, but respect. And given the tone of this movie, who the hell thought it was a good idea to try and turn it into a comedy in the first place? While I appreciate Raymond Burr treating Godzilla with respect, I still don't think he's going to be much help trying to stop him. He's looking for something. Searching. If only we could figure out what it is. He's looking to kill people and fuck shit up. That's about it. Godzilla may be destroying Tokyo, but Japanese hobo Bill Hicks here doesn't seem to mind. Just left Tokyo in August. Welcome, Godzilla. Yeah, I don't know if Godzilla appreciates your welcome. Don't act like a big shot, Hick. You just got to town. If you want to hang around with me, you better learn some manners, huh? <laughs> okay, I don't know who this guy is or what he has to do with the rest of the movie, but I like him. Time for Professor Hayashida to test out that bird frequency. <laughs> Hey, it worked! Oh shit, it worked. Hey, what do you know? I think that's the first time in a Godzilla movie the Japanese army actually managed to save somebody. Unfortunately, they find out they're not able to exit the building. They probably should have asked the janitor for his keys before he left. And wasn't there some new weapon they wanted to use against Godzilla? Oh, hey, there it is. You know, for all the bitching critics did about the movie's effects, I really don't think they look that bad. Sure, they're still dated by today's standards, but some shots actually look pretty good for a 30-plus-year-old movie. Oh, and in case you think I'm being too generous here, here's a clip from a big-budget American movie from roughly the same time. Yes, but truly this Godzilla movie was the shittiest looking thing in theaters back then. The Super X attacks Godzilla by exploiting his one weakness, pretty lights. Oh, and they also shoot some missiles into his throat that give him heartburn or something. Damn, if only he had something cool and refreshing he could drink right now. I think somebody might have spiked Godzilla's Dr. Pepper. He looks a little tipsy. And holy shit, did the army actually manage to defeat Godzilla? Professor, is Godzilla dead? No, it can't die so easily. Yeah, we just restarted the series. Meanwhile, the Soviet nuclear missile gets launched towards Tokyo, although by the looks of it, they still got a few months before it gets there. The Japanese government asks the Americans to shoot the missile down, and they respond by sending their best stock footage. Kenny also comes by in a helicopter to rescue our main characters, which I think is the first time a Kenny's actually been useful in a Japanese monster movie. Unfortunately, he's only able to rescue Professor Hayashida. They need him to star in Japanese The Mechanic. Hmm, either they're about to shoot the nuclear missile down, or Indiana Jones is on his way to another adventure. What the fuck? Well, they stopped the nuclear missile, and the explosion managed to add some color to this movie. It also causes a lightning storm, which ends up reviving Godzilla. And you know what that means. It means I get to do this. Get the fuck up! Simon says, get the fuck up! Throw your hands in the sky! Jesus in the back, sipping yak, yo, what's up? Okay, so Godzilla's back, but the Super X can just stop him again, right? Nope, they're screwed. You know things are serious when Godzilla starts giving the Billy Idol lip. And again, the effects aren't that bad in this. These two try and make their way out of the building, and what do you know, Hobo Bill Hicks actually figured into the main plot. 
Bob from City of the Living Dead didn't even do that, and he was in like half the movie. Meanwhile, looks like the Super X isn't doing too well against Godzilla. They probably shouldn't have used up all their heartburn missiles so early. Keep the change, you filthy animal. They better get the hell out of there. If you thought this movie looked gloomy before, it looks downright apocalyptic now. You're getting to be a nuisance! Back off! Back off! And then Hobo Bill Hicks faked his death and became Japanese Hobo Alex Jones. He's got some interesting theories about the Japanese government putting chemicals in the water to make giant gay frog monsters. Well, looks like they're out of options. Sure hope Professor Hayashida's flock of seagulls frequency works. Okay, you know I had to do that. This is a very intense scene. I especially like how this one guy dramatically drinks a Dr. Pepper. After Godzilla reaches the volcano, they cause it to erupt, but joke's on them, this just ends up making Godzilla look even more badass. He does squeal like a bit of a bitch, though. And so Godzilla falls into the volcano where he remains trapped, at least until the next movie. But not before we get some parting words from Raymond Burr. For now, Godzilla, that strangely innocent and tragic monster has gone to earth whether he returns or not the things he has taught us remain perhaps man is the real godzilla or something the return of godzilla was a success in japan leading to a revived series of films commonly referred to as the heisei series by fans but its release in North America was less successful, and as a result, a Japanese Godzilla movie wouldn't get another theatrical release there until Godzilla 2000, 15 years later. The movie was also hated by critics, receiving a one-star review from Roger Ebert, and getting nominated for Worst Picture at the 1985 Stinker's Bad Movie Awards. And like I said earlier, Leonard Maltin gave it his lowest rating, even lower than Godzilla's Revenge, which he gave two and a half stars? The fuck? All right, you heard it here first, folks. In critics' minds, this... ...isn't nearly as good as this. Look, don't get me wrong, the movie definitely has its flaws. The Dr. Pepper product placement is kind of awkward, and there's a lot of philosophizing about Godzilla's purpose that doesn't really amount to anything. But as far as achieving what it set out to do, which is make Godzilla destructive and scary again, I think it was a success. It's easily the darkest Godzilla movie since the first one, and parts of it have a downright apocalyptic look to them. It also managed to successfully update and reboot the series after years of decline. I realize I'm probably a bit biased since this was my introduction to Godzilla, but even after all these years, it's still one of my favorites, and I think it's an underrated entry in the series. I will concede that it's not very funny, though. Well, that's all for now. Until next Hold on a second, Brandon. GojiFan93? What are you doing here? Oh, I think you know exactly why I'm here. What do you mean? You made yet another Godzilla video without asking me to be in it. Well, I don't know. I thought you quit. I told you I'd still be available for crossovers and cameos. You think I didn't want to be in this video? This is my all-time favorite Godzilla movie. There's a lot I want to say. Okay, well, make it quick, will you? The video's almost over. Okay. <clears throat> Godzilla 1985... <laughs> Thank you.
Peace.